So this might not be the most structured presentation I've ever done, as I wasn't going to do one an hour ago, but um, I, I think I would like to start by talking a bit about some of the things that Rob Lloyd told me when I interviewed him. He works with numbers of children down in Kent, so he's based with the Red Cross in Gravesend, and they've come up with this very innovative programme that lasts 16 weeks, and they have cohorts of children coming in. Their original expectation was that this would be a lot of Afghan children with no leave to remain, because that's always been a big part of the unaccompanied asylum-seeking children group within the UK. What they in fact found is it's a lot of Eritrean <coughs> young people who have arrived and been given asylum relatively quickly. But what they do is they teach the children this very... Um, broad ranging set of life skills so in a lot of cases children that come in unaccompanied get taught these life skills that are around cooking shopping budgeting how to call the police and things like that which are all very important but then there's a lot of other things that 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 are important to being part of the UK that are kind of left out so Rob teaches them a lot about their rights and entitlements and about multiculturalism. And he described to me teaching a session where they have a sheet on the wall and, and, and they separate the things that belong to all these different cultures. And then they put them all onto a sheet that says multiculturalism. And when they discuss that, the children can all see that, yes, this is a really good thing, that things from everywhere are tolerated, different religions, different foods, different languages, all these different kinds of music and culture that all belong in one country, and that's Britain's multicultural society. And so that's the sort of the theory of it, and they get it. And he then described taking them out to visit a religious centre, now, all the Eritrean children are, on the whole, are all Eritrean Orthodox Christians. But Gravesend has a very large Indian community, and where he was actually taking them was a Sikh Gurudwara. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a beautiful, enormous temple, and apparently it's very popular with people in Gravesend to just go and have a bit of peace and quiet. And these children were horrified at the thought that they were not being taken to a Christian religious centre, but to a Sikh one. And he was initially a bit surprised by their reaction, but sort of grew to understand it, that the children felt that this was quite an affront to them. They didn't want to take off their shoes. They didn't want to go in. There was one young man who agreed to go in, and the lady showing them around said, well, among other things, well, we don't believe that our God is either a man or a woman. And this young man was so offended that despite barely speaking any English, he said, well, madam, in my culture, we don't believe that. And, um, and it, it, was, it was this process of coming to understand that for these kids who had been through so much and lost so much, they were clinging on to this aspect of their identity quite furiously and that it took time for them to... They were very good at accepting white British people. That was what they expected to find when they got here, and they expected to have to get to know white British people and white British culture. And that whole sort of multicultural mass that, that actually faced them when they got here was a bit more difficult for them to cope with. And really, it was when they all played football together that they actually started to talk to one another and communicate. And I know that that's also been a problem for other people that I interviewed, for example, accommodation providers who said, oh, you can't house Afghan and Albanian children together. They don't get on. And, and, and they were surprised by that because both groups were Muslim. And so what Rob said to me is there's an assumption that because they've come from somewhere else, they'll just kind of rock along with everybody else. And that's not true. It takes time and a bit of input to get people to understand one another, just as it does for children here. Um, 
you know, and it, it perhaps shouldn't be so surprising. And so what's really great about the programme that Rob runs is it, it kind of, it brings the children together in a slightly different way than anything else in their lives does, it helps them to understand the culture of Britain in a completely different way. Um, and somebody else that I had interviewed that I hoped was going to be here today, but she in the end had to go and deal with some stuff in Sweden. Um, she is a nurse who uh, works for the NHS, but she's attached to the Looked After Children's Service in Brighton. And she ran another programme that struck me as very innovative, which is group work around sex education with these young men, boys and young men, that have come here as unaccompanied children. And it occurred to me that, of course, every society has its rules, some of them written, some of them unwritten. And my son, who's 10, has started now with sex education at school. But, of course, if you arrive here at 15, 16 years old, you miss all that teaching about a lot of those unwritten rules. And so they had this group work programme, which the boys engaged with really well and continued coming week after week, um, where they really learn about all these other sort of community rules that perhaps are not obvious. Um, and that sort of leads on to a lot of other things. And if you, if you transgress those rules, you face exclusion from the community. But if you understand those rules and get to know them, you can be part of the community in a different way. So really doing this project, I came at it from a background as a barrister specialising in immigration and asylum law. So I came at it knowing a lot about the Home Office asylum process and how callous and horrible that can be. Um, but not so much about how these children can become part of the community that they're kind of thrown into. Um, I just wanted to pick up on some of what was said in the last panel about issues around the possibility of isolation if you disperse people too thinly. So if you have just one or two people here and one or two people there, they perhaps don't have the community support that they have if there's more of a community. And this is something that's really quite an issue for unaccompanied children. Um, and as, as Adrian will know, there are really big concentrations of children in some places. So Brighton and Hove had, in April when I, uh, when I interviewed them, eight unaccompanied children seeking asylum. Kent, at the same time, had 376. And that was an increase of a couple of hundred on the, a year earlier. And they were struggling, understandably, to fit all of these children into schools. They were struggling to get children into foster care. So, for example, a child of 16 or 17 in Brighton would still be expected to go into foster care and to remain there till they're at least 18 years old, if not longer. In Kent, if they arrive at 16 or 17, they have a fairly minimal chance of getting into foster care because there's a limit to the number of foster carers that exist. Um, they were having trouble getting those children into school because obviously we live in a densely packed southeast of England, there is a limited number of places in schools, but they also had a problem that they were placing children in areas where there were colleges that were willing to accept them and to provide ESOL, English for Speakers of Other Languages. And there were particular colleges where accommodation was relatively available as well, and this was obviously a good place for them to be putting the children. Um, they then faced the problem that certain district councils were becoming quite resistant to the numbers of unaccompanied children we placed in that area. And all of a sudden, the colleges were stopping providing ESOL. Um, I was told that academies in the Thanet district were no longer accepting children who were not indigenous to Thanet, so looked after children who came from somewhere other than Thanet were not getting into those schools. Um, and this was a really big problem. They were then being forced to send children much further for education. They were having to go into London. 
And um, after I'd finished all the field work from this, I was told that the colleges in Lewisham, which was where a lot of them were going, were also cutting their ESOL courses. So the children were sort of having to go further and further afield to access any sort of education that might meet their needs. So there's a real problem around the concentration of children that has in fact got worse and worse since then. Um, in early September, Kent's numbers were up to 730. So they'd almost doubled from the levels that were already difficult in April. They've gone up and up since then. So 44 arrived in the first five days of October. Um, and there's a real problem because you can only pass on children to other local authorities if they accept them voluntarily. And sadly, very few of them have been willing to accept voluntarily. I'm really proud of Brighton, I have to say, actually, because Brighton has taken, or has offered to take on 10, one per week over a 10-week period. So it can be done, and it can be done with, as, as was said in the previous panel, with planning, not an excess of planning that drags it out forever, but with planning and with consideration, and in a way that enables those children to, to have the balance between peer support and being within a community that's supportive, but not being so over-concentrated that really their needs and their rights under the Children Act or under the Convention on the Rights of the Child can't be met. And so I think one of the... Um, one of the things we can perhaps take forward in whatever sort of backgrounds you've come from is kind of that advocacy with local authorities to say, it's actually not as hard as you might think. Come on, take a few of these from Kent because even if things are not perfect here, it, it's better than it is there. Um, I will stop there and we can obviously talk more in the discussion. Thank you, Jill.